Welcome to another edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen, a day to focus on energy and what uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has really meant to global energy markets. They have been, to say the least, turned upside down. Oil prices have skyrocketed, and that means the price of everything else is going up, including the price of food, which may be a secondary crisis here. David Yeager is an entrepreneur, a journalist, the author of a book entitled From Miracle to Menace, Alberta, A Carbon Story, a book about the importance and the history of the oil industry when it comes to paying Canada's bills. In his career of more than 40 years working in and reporting on the oil patch, he shed an awful lot of light on these issues that have uh, hit us directly in these last couple of weeks. Welcome, David. So nice to have you here. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. So let us just start with that. Um, the, The energy market has been turned upside down. The prices are going up. Where are we as you take stock today? We're in a real challenge, uh, uh, Senator Wallen. We're in a, we're in a supply deficit. The, I think what's happened, perhaps maybe the best way to say it, is in the, increasingly in this cent- uh, um, century, we've replaced uh, fact with fiction. That if I say the right things and believe them, uh, that I can change the world. And so we've said we've you know climate change is a challenge. I don't dispute that. The lower carbon energy would be better. No argument there. But the point is, is we've replaced uh, we've replaced physics and science with with emotion and goodwill. So what's happened, particularly since two thousand and nine, is we've gone down this path of of public decarbonation or or spiritual decarbonation, and we haven't paid attention to what the world actually uses. So when you when you say that the world uses more renewable energy than ever before. It does actually, if you look at all the charts, they indicate there's been more more wind and solar and et cetera than ever, but there's more people. So what has happened in this century and all these efforts to decarbonize and all this end of fossil fuels is not any fossil fuels have actually been displaced. All we have really done is kept up with demand. And that's fine. That's fine. You know, the new, yeah. the new demand is being met by renewables and that'll happen. But we haven't actually displaced any fossil fuels. And so we, the, uh, the, um, in the recent years in particular, the anti-fossil fuel movement caught wind in the, in the eastern countries. They brought, blocked fracking in Europe. We blocked pipelines in Canada. We blocked the capital markets. And so and the, combined with low commodity prices, the reinvestment in new supplies has been low. So all of a sudden, the world came out of COVID, looked around, went back to work, mm-hmm. still running on fossil fuels, whether we ought to or not, and we discovered a, a severe su- supply deficit. So we had we had a problem before the war. We had a problem yeah. before the war, long before the war. They just 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 so you know, we were warned. The International Energy Agency started writing halfway through last year that by twenty three twenty four. Without serious investment in new supplies, we had a we had a pending oil supply problem, and now the Ukraine situation has just accelerated that. So that's the Coles notes on how we got into this mess. Yeah, I want to come back to that whole question of reinvestment and investment because the companies themselves are being constrained by um, access to capital because they need to meet other considerations like environmental and social and governance and ESG as it's called. But let me just, um, let me just start here with the impact of the sanctions. So we say we are stopping the import of Russian oil. We don't actually technically take any here, but the U S does. And certainly Europe is quite dependent. Has that started to impact? Um, not yet, in the sense that uh, Asia has been taking up the surplus. They're just sending right. it to different places. But when I'm reading all the trade press this morning, they're saying that sometime next month, uh, we, we could be looking at a 3 million barrel supply deficit. I mean, it's going to take effect. So they're drawing down inventories of refined products. Remember, it wasn't just Russia exported, not just oil and gas, but they also are not a refined product. So the inventories are being drawn down. And so it would appear that uh, that's what I was reading in the trade press this morning. Okay. It's a very significant so the, ending the Im- deficit. 
the impact on Russia, because we think we're going to, you know, bring them to their knees because nobody is going to buy their oil. Uh, and you're saying that's not true. They're just selling it to different customers. And B, we don't have a lot to replace it with anyway. There's uh, several aspects of that. First of all, Russia is a huge exporter. They, they will never run out of oil themselves. So in, in historical military conflicts, the first thing you would talk is the supplies of the, of the other guy. It, that's pointless. I mean, Russia for its own needs and to keep its army fuel, there is no shortage. What they are, what I saw uh, yesterday, the other day was now India is looking at because of the Correct. sanctions on banking. Uh, they're saying, well, what do you think of rubles for rupiah? And so it looks like they're working out something. And yeah. of course, China is going to take some more. So the the whole world uh, hasn't hasn't yet run out of oil, but it's certainly moving around. Europe is particularly vulnerable. Europe is uh, totally hooked on Russian coal, gas, and oil. There are no alternative supplies for them at that time, so they actually have to buy fuel from the people they're scrapping with. That is unprecedented. When we watched this, and it was last week, but I'm assuming it's still going on now that rather than kickstart their own industry again in the United States, it's true here to a certain extent too, they're trying to get oil from Venezuela, from Iran, places that they are all enemies with, phoning OPEC countries who've kind of maxed out their production right now anyway. But but really, is that we'd rather deal with another set of bad guys than produce a resource we have plenty of? I have to watch modern politics in uh, shock and awe, <laughs> and it's, uh, and I think and you've been a journalist uh, a long time and you know what's happened to the way people communicate and what they communicate about. Uh, I almost think that the, the 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 people that support the Democratic Party actually don't know where oil comes from, and maybe don't follow this story. It's 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 the business people and people like yourselves that know what to look and where. The idea that you would block Keystone cancel Keystone twice, you would put all these conditions in on your domestic oil industry. You you brag about a giant leaf sale, a leaf uh, lease sale in the Gulf of Mexico, and then have it canceled by the courts and and tell the industry to spend more money. We're not the problem. And then go shopping with the world's bad guys for oil, you know, Venezuela and like the place you mentioned. You just have to shake your head some days. But uh, but it would appear that in modern politics, the the core climate crowd uh, that uh, that supports the Democrats or to whoever Biden et al are are, are are reaching out to they don't see either don't connect the dots or don't care that that, that they want the United States to be a, an example of something it is it is really really something because I can't imagine how this will end well it's just, we you know, the, the idea of, of conflict and displacement, well, it's in the news today because of the Russia Ukrainian mm -hmm. outfit. I don't think as many people have yet left yet the, the left left yet yet left. Good Gord. Yeah. Really, the Ukraine as of many as have fled Venezuela over the years okay. under Maduro. I mean, there's been a huge outpouring of, uh, of refugees from Venezuela because of the, of the conditions yep. in that country. So this idea of moving where you have to to survive is not new. It's just it's in the headlines because this particular one is in, is in Europe. This is, uh, and then of course, the, the Iranian nuclear, oh boy, what a world, eh? Well, the, the, it is truly puzzling and, and perhaps we'll come back to that in a moment. The European country, countries. And I think we watched Germany go through um, the most profound change since World War II <laughs> in terms of its ability and its willingness to engage militarily. But they are also pivoting fast to build LNG import terminals to stockpile coal because they're going to need it. France has committed to more nuclear reactors, something that we need here. Um, the UK is thinking, rethinking its ban on, on fracking. Um, so they're kind of going, their natural instinct, it seems, is, okay, we've got a supply crisis, but we've got uh, resources here, let's use them. We're the U.S. is saying, no, we'll just go buy from a different set of bad guys. It's puzzling that, that Europe is able to switch gears that quickly. The, uh, 
the it's it uh, the pivoting is really remarkable. I, one of the things about the UK is they hosted the COP26 uh, climate right. conference in Glasgow as recently as yeah. November, where they were going to end uh, fossil fuel subsidies. And then uh, just the other day, I think it was a $16 billion subsidy in, in, in prices. And Germany's doing all the things and it's uh, and they're cutting uh, fuel taxes uh, all over the world to make it more affordable. Japan's doing this, New Zealand now, uh, Sweden. And uh, in the States, they're actually looking at uh, re- releasing their security, their petroleum reserves of all things. We'll just, in case we won't have anything in case it gets worse. Uh, they're talking about cutting gasoline taxes. They're, they'd like uh, the U.S. industry to drill. And of course, at the recent Sierra conference, they said, well, we'd like you to quit persecuting us. I think so. I think actually the U.S. is a little further um, up, the, up the reality ladder, if you will. It's Canada is the one that astonishes me. Canada is the one that, that seems to be, you know, we've, we've, uh, we're on this climate track. I haven't seen any signals that, that Canada is accepting global realities. I mean, even the U.S., their, their situation is peculiar, but at yeah. least they admit there's a problem. Whereas I think they need it and they'll go out and buy it. Well, they get it somewhere in the short term. And they are. And the energy secretary, Grant Old, I believe her name, is is making the right noises. Would you please drill? And we're, you know, we're not the problem. And so there is encouragement uh, for the domestic oil industry in the U.S. to go back to work and and deal with the supply issue. Um, There's polling in the States that indicates that maybe they should look at Keystone a little late, but uh, whatever. I would say uh, I would say the country that's really going going nowhere is ours. Yeah, I want to ask about Keystone because that is, um, you know, that's an issue where everybody thinks it could be uh, a salvation. They could restart Keystone that could move about 900 barrels a day, 900 million barrels a day. It, it Can they, A, if there was some huge change in the political thinking and B, would it solve this problem that we're facing? Wouldn't solve the, I mean, can't, we can't get that pipe built in this year. Yeah. But the pipe is, as I understand it, the pipe was bought and ordered and sitting in yards. The right of way has been surveyed. The environmental impact was done. If you wanted to build Keystone, there's not a pipeline in the world that could be resuscitated and bear, dug and buried faster than Keystone. It's something I would believe if, if it were, uh, I was just watching videos of what they did during the Second World War with the Canal pipeline, during when they built a, a pipeline from uh, from uh, Norman Wells to Fairbanks in no time, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of winter. Were it to become a national imperative, they could probably have that thing up and running by the end of next year. And that would be, you know, whether we could fill it or not is another issue. But of course, that's another issue. Is, is like but but of, that's a question. So because production has has slowed here, I mean, we just witnessed an Alberta budget where they're they're uh, in good shape because the price of oil is up, and it seems to be there's activity. What what is going on? We could uh, we could the one of the biggest delays in in adding production is permitting. Regulatory compliance and permitting. We did. A, there was a study on LNG plants, and I was just reading the other day that a major project takes 19 months longer in Canada to study. And so, if you wanted to build another oil sands plant, I mean, it's it typically it's two or three years of lead time. They know where the oil is. They know how to build these things. It's just it really depends if if there were some urgency. You could do a lot of things in a lot shorter period of time, but of course there has been no urgency and we have this new uh, Bill C-69, <clears throat> this new applications process. And, and, and so, so the, there's two aspects. There's one, is it is it possible? Yeah, it is possible. You could bury that pipe in a heartbeat. You could, uh, you could make uh, North American security supply <clears throat> an important uh, transporter issue. And you could go to work and you could make a material in, increase in North American production and, and North American uh, energy security in, uh, in, in a relatively short period of time, just a couple of years, really, if you want to really want to get at it. And uh, but the question is, is, is who wants to really get at it? That's that's the challenge. We've got yeah, governments on both clear. sides of the border that uh, campaigned on doing the exact opposite. Yeah, at the very least, and I mean, this is obviously not my area of expertise, but it, it seems to me that given what we're all witnessing, Keystone would at the very least be some kind of strategic insurance policy, right? That it will we'll work on it, just as you say, in case things keep getting worse. 
They uh, did this. Uh, it was the Trudeau administration that made such a move in the 1970s when we had the oil, or the big oil crisis, yeah. and he insisted that a pipeline be built from Sarnia to Montreal, uh, at Enbridge Line Nine, and that was make sure that if things got even worse, in the end the situations reversed themselves, and and the, the actual oil was not required. But it was an insurance policy. But of course, we this is the we've got this just in time uh, energy mm -hmm. policy. So I would say that 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 would be a permanent signal uh, to the world that Fortress North America is, is going to pursue uh, oil independence, uh, a subject to all the conditions. And, and yeah, it would so resurrecting it, it would be would be a great idea, and and it would really send a signal to investors to the world that we're serious about this. It would be done, of course, with the greatest, all the new uh, technology being involved. You could attach uh, carbon capture, utilization and storage to it. You could make it, you could make it, uh, comply with all the aspirations of what, right. of low carbon fossil fuels. It'd be great because it'd be the newest stuff around. So it would have the lowest emissions. You could do all those things. If you decided you really wanted to solve the problem, which is why I, you know, why I sometimes get, uh, you know, I think sometimes I look at our response in, in Canada and I say it's a real global problem. We have, I can't think of a country in the world that has more to offer yeah. uh, in terms of oil and gas resources, that has done more to make sure the world can't have them than Canada. It, that's embarrassing. That is really something. If you look at the 18 LNG projects that were on the books at one point, they only built one just as recently as last summer, Quebec canceled an LNG project on the East Coast, you know, hydropower closest, you know, we block pipelines. It's incredible. And so the whole world's looking for oil. Now, just, just to put it into context, oil peaked in 2008, $145 a barrel. And then it was on a downwards uh, for the next uh, 12 years until 2020 when it went negative because of COVID. One of the reasons that we were able to control the food crisis and the inflation of 2008 and the high oil prices was between in the next 12 years, the United States and Canada added 10 million barrels a day of production to the world. Changed the entire world global balance. Two million came out of Alberta, <clears throat> excuse me, with oil sands, and eight million came out of the United States. And in the 70s, when the world had an oil shortage, it was the Western countries. It was the North Slope of Alaska. It was the North, European North Sea and the oil sands. Those are the ones that moved the needle. It wasn't OPEC. It wasn't Russia. It was OECD. It was the Western countries that dealt with the security of supply issue and solved it. And here we are again. We could do it again. But uh, we see but that we people, won't. Well, they're changing their tune in Europe because they're vulnerable. Yeah. They are changing fast in Europe. Uh, the United States is it's a preponderance reawakening. <laughs> but, yeah. but well, I mean, they have to say one thing publicly about this. And I was watching the uh, the U.S. press secretary the other day, uh, Jen Psaki, talking about this, and she said, "Look, there are you know, this doesn't have anything to do with the government. We're not preventing oil production. There's nine thousand unused permits out there, and people, the companies." aren't drilling because it's not obviously in their interest, but it's not a political decision. Now, <clears throat> that's disingenuous, we know, but but that is how they are trying to uh, present this. They're trying to blame everyone but themselves. They're trying to blame the Russians for this problem. I was reading something interesting that came out of Syria <clears throat> of those 9,000 undeveloped permits. Apparently, half of them are in court. Yeah, I mean, they're being, you, know, people, you know, they're offshore, so they're being challenged. They're being challenged here. They're being challenged there. The uh, you alluded to it a little earlier. The ESG movement is still alive yeah. and well. They're still the the, the banks, the capital providers. You know, one of the most amazing things that happened in the seventies, and we could do this on both both sides of the border, is when oil prices got really high. What came on to what came in on stream was stripper production. Really marginal wells that that uh, and Saskatchewan's got a whack of, but so does Alberta yeah. and the whole, the whole United States. And so what there was in the seventies was there was a whole bunch of stripper production came on stream, which is really easy. But of course, these are the smallest players in the business, and they're the ones that really can't get financing. You know, they go to the local Correct. bank, they yeah. go to the local, you know, they they need capital, you know, they need capital to get started, right? So they go to the local bank and, you know, you're a small guy that wants to borrow oil. Um, the, the only people that could borrow money 
These days are the big, giant, credit-worthy companies with an ESG department so that, you know, the ESG cops can come in and you can check all the boxes, you know, when you get all this stuff. And you're, if you're a little independent operator with a couple suspended wells in the backyard, you know, what's your ESG <laughs> plan? You know, I, I yeah. call that energy, safety, and groceries. Yeah, I have an energy, I have an ESG <laughs> plan. And, and you go to your bank, you can't get any capital. And, and so we, we they're, 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 they're right in front of us, at the smallest levels of the oil patch, there's an opportunity to actually go to work tomorrow, put a bunch of people to work, start firing up old wells. Well, there's regulatory issues, there's compliance issues, there's financing issues. It's just I don't think that the, the world really appreciates the degree to which the deck is stacked against just bringing on oil. Let's just say for a moment, and, and of course it's not going to happen, that uh, that Canada realizes that this is <clears throat> a crisis and we're going to set aside all the incentives that are there for people not to invest right. in oil and gas. As you say, this this profile of, of uh, ESG, environmental, social and governance concerns, which now seems to be a prerequisite or maybe an incentive to get funds. But let's just say we decided to do the right thing and get as much uh, oil production underway so that we could solve the problem in Europe, that we could not be held hostage by uh, by Mr. Putin. Uh, could we do it? We still oh, can't get oil to Tidewater on either end of the country. Um, we can't. Get, you can get it to Tidewater. Don't forget if it's oil, don't forget crude by rail. Yeah. Uh, you know, crude by rail was up to 400,000 barrels today. It's almost like having half a Keystone pipeline. A bunch of this just got taken away because of Enbridge Line 3. Uh, GMX is still, you know, I, 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 I think they're going to finish that. <laughs> you wouldn't know it by reading the paper every day, but uh, it would appear that there's, uh, they're going to finish that. And so the, there may not be a million barrels of take takeaway capacity. Well, there's certainly a couple of hundred thousand barrels or 300,000 barrels over time when you include crude by rail and de-bottlenecking pipelines. Um, I, I, and, and so I, there, there is, uh, but there's these other forces about, about drilling. Well, I mean, one, of, one, of the, one of the phenomena that, that's really new that doesn't get enough attention is the six Canadian banks signed up with Mark Carney and mm -hmm. with the, with the, uh, at, at for, uh, uh, COP26 in Glasgow. And that was a real heartbreaker for me because, of course, uh, they've done really well by financing the resource industries in Canada. And and so what's happened is, and I was... They like profited said, greatly, I think. It's they very, have, they yeah. have profited <laughs> greatly, you know. They, uh, and, uh, and, and one of the... One, I was in talking to an institutional fund manager in Calgary just a couple of weeks ago that used to money, uh, manage uh, money on behalf of pension funds. A lot of producers today feel that their future will only be secure if they're debt free. And they're paying down debt because they don't know when this loan rolls over, you know, like, yeah. got, you know, yeah. these companies got all these bonds. They're actually wondering if they, because a lot of it isn't term debt, like we're used to with a mortgage. A lot of it is paper debt that matures in three or five years or whatever. And they're really wondering if when those when those bonds mature, what they'll be able to replace them with and what the cost will be. And so what I'm seeing for the first time is, is, is debt has always been a component of growing this business, you know, reserve-based loans. And the banks don't want that business anymore. So what we're seeing is, 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 is the oil company, a lot of the producers are looking at their balance sheets. They're taking this opportunity to pay down debt instead of reinvest. And one of the reasons they're doing that is because the, the signals they've been getting for the last couple of years is we don't want your business. Now, we could reverse that tomorrow. Imagine that if the big six bank, uh, six banks woke up uh, and, and they're huge players in this business and just said, ah, oh, we were just kidding. <laughs> you know, Mark Carney seemed like a really good guy. And uh, there was a big, you know, we got caught in the emotion of the thing. But, it, well, but these are these are huge signals. Yeah. That, that I mean, look, them. everybody was getting involved in that. And, and I understand. And Mark Carney was looking for uh, all of those incentives for corporations of all kind, but certainly in energy to yeah. to do the right thing and get into the transition mode and help us move from 
oil and gas to to all the green sources. But what what I see today is a, a crisis um, in the making. We have no idea how long Putin is going to do this and what it means. And we are not ready on the green alternative front to replace any of this. We can't replace what oil and gas does in this country with wind and solar. It's just not there. It's really five. I, I wrote a follow-up article for P Pipeline Online about five things that, would, that could change, move the needle on this. Okay. Number one is the environmentalists. Um, I've asked them to take the year off, the rest of the year off. <laughs> you know, the folks that are vandalizing construction equipment on the, on the coastal gas link pipeline. And yeah. all the people that uh, that are sending the money, why don't you send it to one of the many worthwhile Ukrainian uh, yeah. crisis funds? So there, there's step one. Was you, we just just go away for a while, okay? Uh, step two would be the provinces could make a big uh, a, a contribution. Obviously, Quebec. Well, we were just kidding. We <laughs> we we didn't think this through, and uh, we're going to you know quit blocking everything. They remember uh, Quebec passed a law making uh, domestic uh, oil and gas production in that province illegal. They're in court, you know, with, 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 with suing for permits. The province of British Columbia, I believe, could do more to expeditiously complete Trans Mountain and expeditiously complete Coastal Gaslink. Of course, they've got that land issue with the Blueberry First Nation. They haven't had a rig running on that whole Montney play all this year because of that. The federal government has just got to say, sorry about that. We're just kidding. Uh, step number one, which, and I've got some money on this. I expect to lose the bet. They could say, well, we're not going to raise the carbon tax by 25% on April the 1st because uh, gasoline's already up enough. But you're, the federal you're gonna, government, you're going to lose money. They're going to put the carbon tax hike in. Uh, well, I, uh, I'm, uh, I keep thinking that, uh, that, <laughs> that somebody, in, in, yeah, they, they need the money. It's not about anyway. So item three would be the federal government, the ESG movement. Remember, the fundamentals of ESG is is what they call corporate uh, shareholder stakeholder capitalism. That I'm right. supposed to do the right thing for the stakeholders. Well, the stakeholders right now are short of energy, and we'll get to food hopefully before we're done here. Yeah. There's something yeah. awful going on there too. So the ESG movement has got to say, well, you know, under the circumstances, we move too quickly. We still support renewable energy, but we need we need to pace this. And then number five, when they got the right signals from four players, then the, then the banks could reverse their position, as I said, on the finance side. The fourth player is is the industry can go back to work. They have the cash. But if they're, you know, they do they have to buy back shares to 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 keep their shareholders happy? Do, can they borrow money? Can they do it? Do they have to completely delever? Could it, you know? Could I get some assurances? If those five things happened, um, we could have a material turnaround in Canada, and it would be good for the economy. It would be good for good for the deficit. Got people back to work. I mean, jobs are the greatest thing you could have for Ottawa mm -hmm. right now. They got pay, payroll taxes coming in. Social support quits going out. And it's a wonderful thing. So those are five things that need to be happen. Any one of them will help, but five of them collectively could make a material change in 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 our industry, and we could be proud of our country to make a material contribution to reduce the energy shortage. Well, I don't want to call you Pollyanna, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but isn't I mean, there's so much invested in this now, and and the prime minister just last week was saying, you know, look, we've got your back, and and we're going to get some supplies over there as just as soon as we've got all these new uh, green, more socially acceptable sources up and running. Um, it does not sound to me that there's a, a government that's going to change or get off its track or an industry that dares get off the track um, for fear of the punishment uh, being heightened in some way, that there'll be even greater disincentives to invest in the short term in this industry to solve the problem that the whole world can see. I've looked at the rate of change in the world in just six months. Yeah. And it is the world's, my joke is the world's uh, spinning so quickly. I'm surprised the days aren't only 12 hours long. <laughs> and so I look at the reversals, uh, jaw dropping reversals by the European countries, the EU, yeah. you know, and I look at what they're doing in Europe. And I, I hear that, that I'm hearing things out of Wilkinson about, well, maybe we could do some LNG. 
Uh, you know, there is that um, Beta Nord project. It's temporarily delayed. Yep. I'm told it's not dead. There are there. Could, we could probably put a couple hundred thousand barrels a day on. Uh, they, they had, of course, the Treasury, I understand, is finally realizing that uh, interest rates are going up there. There's a whole bunch of things that are changing. I, I, I say um, Canada is late to the party, but we were invited. We're invited to the party. And, and I would say that we'll see how it goes. But uh, I think the, 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 there's a coming humanitarian crisis in food yeah. that may be, may be the, the needle changer. Uh, you know, I think that this may be the one that puts it over the top. You know, fossil fuels are bad. Food's not bad. <laughs> Still OK to eat. And no, so that's the thing. And I mean, we've got Russia and Ukraine, uh, you know, generating a third of the world's supply of wheat and barley, things like that. And uh and fertilizers. And we've got a huge chunk. I mean, we do, we do a great job here, but again, if our rails are busy, you know, yeah. taking more oil on, that's going to reduce the amount of, of grain they can move around. Like this, this could hit very seriously by the end of the summer. The, uh, it's, uh, I watched the, when I wrote the book, I, I found, I discovered, I was suggested, why don't you follow the Arab Spring back to the price of food? So I did. It was all it was all related. It started out with uh, 2005 when George W. Bush said, "Let's turn corn into gasoline with yeah. ethanol." It was really important. The United States was uh, produced 25 percent of the world's corn at that time, and so the unintended consequences were were huge. And the price of uh, oil. What it was interesting about the, uh, the economic downturn of 08 09 was oil had hit $147 a barrel, food prices had spiked all over the world, and they blamed the recession on subprime mortgages. It was the first time that the oil industry has contributed to a recession and got a hall pass. And so we're in that situation again, and we've got um, all the factors you talked about, and then we've got, uh, we've got we're still living on last winter's uh, storage, Yep. But we're going to have a challenge growing season. The price of fertilizer, I'm working on another article on this, is about 300% across the board uh, up for this year, this year's growing season. Um, the good news, the commodity prices are high. They'll plant what they can. You know, Maybe we'll get a little br- better break on the weather on the southern part of the prairies. But, uh, but the country, the, the, the food aspect of it is something that people really don't understand and the opponents of fossil fuels never mention is the direct linkage between the price of fossil fuels and food, fertilizer, mechanized agriculture, refrigeration, and transportation. So it may be that, it, and it's a terrible way to do these things, but it seems this is the way the world works. We have to have a problem before we have a solution. <laughs> Nobody's thinking ahead anymore. And so I would say food might be what might be one of the, might be what changes a lot of the things over the course of the year. Because we, we could go into the winter of uh, 22, 23 in, in really, really, in really, really tough shape in, in terms of food supplies. I think I would be surprised. They're not going to go hungry in Russia. And I would be very surprised if, uh, if Vladimir Putin hasn't thought this through. And the countries that are already hurting are the ones that uh, buy directly from the Russians, you know, places like Turkey and, and, and in that sphere. We'll be okay in, in Western Canada. Um, we got food, we got fuel. I mean, we're fine, but that's not the point. The point is, is it's not it's, the point, and it's going to be more expensive. I mean, I just I just drove from Saskatchewan to Alberta to to see some friends. I mean, the sticker shock when you're filling up your vehicle at one seventy nine for a liter, you know that that's it makes a difference in terms of your decisions where you go. It's already we're seeing it the prices in the store for food. Uh, I would say under the circumstances, um, I don't think this is, if you can afford it, possibly afford it, uh, you know, at least we can get it. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, on a global point of view, look, no, I, I, point. yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the point, the price is going up. Okay. Uh, we're seeing, um, we're seeing governments who can cut uh, fuel taxes doing that. I cited a few examples earlier. Alberta's already done that with its yeah. excise tax. Uh, they've done this in, again, New Zealand, several states in the U.S., I mean, there is there is possible relief. I mean, in Europe, one of the great sources, of tax, reliable sources of tax revenue for years has been fuel taxes, the one they couldn't evade. So there is some flexibility uh, by governments to 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 make that more affordable. But I think the 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 bigger crisis, and, and we're talking in the hundreds of millions of people affected, 
is the people that can't afford food mm -hmm. and can no longer afford energy. I'm talking about real, real malnutrition or starvation and energy poverty. And it's times like this, those who we should be thinking about. And it would be really nice if, if we could get, if we have a global problem, I, I think if we, if we were thinking globally at all in this country, we wouldn't be in this mess because we're doing all these things to our own economy. We're self-immolating our own economy and our own resource industry. Uh, whereas emission growth is all coming from India and China. We've outsourced our emissions to Asia. So we, we do all these virtue signaling things about, about you know, as, as Michael Schellenberger um, wrote in one of his commentaries, when the West were banning plastic straws and in Russia, they're drilling for oil. I mean, we just got to, we just got to. And rethink. then China's upping its coal production in use. They and, and yeah, exactly. And so what, what difference does it make? You know, when, why, why should I go broke? You know, so I can, uh, so we've got some, hopefully this will, will cause uh, a, a significant reset. One of, one of the aspects before I forget on the subject of food, one of the components of the, of the liberal uh, energy targets is reducing agricultural emissions by 30%. Yep. This is yep. all meant to be done by fertilizer. They yep. want to use less fertilizer, which means and they're taxing <clears> that too. Yeah. They're and they're taxing that. Well, not only that, we're going to what we're our contribution to the global food crisis under the current plan <clears throat> is to limit output by reducing yields by cutting back on fertilizer. Yeah. Uh, uh, somebody at central planning has got you know earth earth to, earth the central planning you know we got what are we doing what what are we really doing on no as, this is an important issue and i know it's kind of on the sideline but but you know i live in the middle of an agricultural sure uh, we all do. community yeah. we we all do and we are the we used to call ourselves the breadbasket that is the, this notion that you've got to reduce the use of fertilizers, even though they're being um, made much more environmentally uh, sensitive than they used to be, when we are producing food for the world, seems bizarre. It is. Uh, it is. I think going back to our earlier conversation about what's going on in the states, I think it is possible because people just don't understand. You know, urban yeah. voters, uh, they go to the grocery store. The only thing they know is the price. Yeah. They've never run out of anything. They've got no idea how supply chains work. They don't know where the food comes from. They don't know where their energy comes from. And maybe, you know, this is unfortunately, regrettably, we have to get, we have to have the problem before we have the solution. Yeah. Maybe the situation we're in with food and energy is the one where people say, well, where, where does this come from? Yeah, we try, we try. I mean, <clears throat> Lord knows the agricultural and, and oil and gas producing industries, you know, our, our trade associations, uh, tons of stuff. Where does this come from? It's yeah. just that with uh, with the modern media where everything's on your smartphone and they're watching NBA scores and Kim Kardashian, yeah. <laughs> they, nobody seems to read this stuff. The the other thing I heard a former premier say the other day, and and it was almost a toss off remark. But you know, if we do, it was in the context of budgets, and well, you know, we can always pay the oil workers, you know, to go off and retrain to become coders and this uh, and that. Yeah. And the response was, if you shut down the oil and gas sector, I hope you're prepared to give up your health care because that's what <laughs> yeah, funds yeah. a lot of the social <clears throat> programs we have right across this country. One of the themes of my book was Alberta without oil is Manitoba with mountains. I mean, <laughs> that's what we do. The only reason 4.4 million people live in Alberta and the rest of the neighborhood has nowhere near that. And I'm talking about Saskatchewan, Manitoba, yep. North Dakota, yep. Montana, and even uh, BC uh, with notwithstanding the lower mainland is because we're an absolute massive global carbon warehouse. And so the whole point when the theme of my book was when you, if you were successful in decarbonizing Alberta, uh, look for 2 million economic refugees because that's all we do. We, you know, that's yeah. what we do. We're landlocked. We, 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 it's, it's all we'll say, well, why don't you produce electricity? Well, everybody has electricity. Yeah. What they don't have is what we have. And the same thing as Saskatchewan. I've been writing for Pipeline Online. I've been writing a whole bunch of stuff about, about the resource powerhouse of Saskatchewan. It's incredible. Yeah. And, I, you know, just some of the little things about not being there yet. I was just listening the other day that, 
you know, there we have rules and regulations now that that automobile sales operations, uh, you know, dealers are going to be obliged to sell X many EV cars and pretty soon only EV cars. The only downside of that, not the only, but one of the downsides is before that happens, we need four million charging stations across <laughs> Canada. It would be That's nice. going to be a big buy. <clears throat> It would be nice to be able to get to, if I live in Calgary, it'd be nice to get to Edmonton back in the winter uh, without having to stop to re recharge. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just the people, this is an urban, uh, th this is the problem, yeah. urban, rural, Yeah. is the people to whom this appeals. And if I lived in the city and didn't have to go very far, sure. and the grid was set up so that I could recharge at night, it's an elegant solution. You know, if I lived yeah. in the city and I was just scooting around, but I don't, I work in the oil patch. And often I, when I still have to go in the field, uh, um, it's a five hour trip one way. Yeah. And so, and that same thing as Saskatchewan, you got to drive everywhere. Yep. And, it's, it's, and it's, so there aren't thinking. And the, and the point is, this is where the things we need come from. And, yeah. and it's just the, the, the modern politics finds the, the voters that will give them what they want. And they're, they're just, and they do, they get what they want, but not you know, what they need. We'll, we'll, we'll end where we began, which is if we used our heads, we could do both things at once. Canada, uh, uh, Canada could move the needle on food and energy. We could rejoin the world as a resource powerhouse. We could wake up and say the best thing we can do to save the world is not to deny them food and oil and gas, yeah. but get them more. That's what we could do. Yeah. That would be a material shift in where we've gone. Because again, when you look at our ability, it's, it's the greatest treasure trove of, of energy and food that we are systematically denying the world in a virtuous but pointless attempt to save the planet. A half, one, half of 1% 1 of the world is gonna save the planet. Uh, this dog won't hunt. And I appreciate your asking me that question because it defies common sense. David, great to talk to you. I, I read a lot of what you write and it's just so sensible. So, so thank you. It's not like we, we can't do these things. We can be greener and more environmentally sound and move the, the needle in that direction. But we are um, the place that can solve the energy and food issues. And I think it's our moral responsibility to do it. But I agree completely. <laughs> this is the right thing to do it's is just something the right else. Thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. David bet. Yeager, he's an entrepreneur, a journalist. He he writes about and, and works in the oil patch, so he knows what he's talking about. I think fair to say you're not a charter member of Greenpeace or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and his book is uh, From Miracle to Menace, Alberta Carbon Story. Takes a look at the uh, contributions, not just through oil and gas, but through the contributions to this country. David, great to talk. I hope we talk again soon. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Yeah, thanks, David. And that is it for this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen.